What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Bill Tendo Show. I am your host, Bill Tendo, along with my buddy, Mike. That's me. Welcome. Each week we're here to talk about anything and everything in this magical retro haven. Uh, Billy and I will talk about a variety of things that interest us uh, in the worlds of pop culture, video games, TV, and movies, mostly in the 80s, 90s, and 2000s, because that's what gets us hot. Billy, talk about yourself. Yeah. I am Bill Tindo, so I have my website, BillTindo.com, where I sell a lot of video games. Uh, I also do a lot of modding. Um, I, I like to make give people access to games because I'm a player first and I'm a collector second. Um, and I think that kind of pushes into what we're going to talk about today, but uh, tell us something about you, Mike. I don't do anything. I work and I come home, and that's when I play video games. I try not to make video games <laughs> my, my second work like some other people in this show do. Uh, video games are released for me. I like TV and movies. My family likes the same stuff, so I come home and keep it light. That's awesome. That is awesome. So what are we going to talk about today, Mike? Um. The new format of the show, now that we're streamlined and dialed in on this very, very expensively produced podcast slash radio show, uh, I'm just going to start with some normal news. We'll go through some retro stuff, and then we'll uh, talk about whatever our variety topic of the day is. Today, we're going to talk about physical and digital media and which one Billy prefers. Yeah, so um, to be perfectly honest... I think this is a great subject for us because, uh, and just so everybody knows, Mike and I have decided to run with a, a ad lib format here. Like, we barely discuss anything about the topics beforehand. We basically just pick a topic and then we talk about it. So we have no prior knowledge on the other person's stance on anything. Um, with that being said, I have uh, flip flopped greatly over the last couple of years on physical media versus um, digital media. I'm still not fully on board with the way most Xbox and PlayStation games you have to download to your console. I'm not a big fan of that because if something ever happens, you lose your stuff. But as far as from a strictly player perspective, over the last couple of years, I have fallen from being a big collector and I wanted to have every game in my collection to someone who just mods consoles to play. I have my uh, Ultra Mod Wii, which has everything on it. I have a Pico modded GameCube that I use. I have an EverDrive for my Nintendo 64. Um, I, so I'm real big on the emulation because I like having access to games. So I'm not so much physical over the last few years where I used to be heavily physical. I like to be able to play the games. I like them right there in front of me. Are so, you harness that energy, Billy. <laughs> and I'll tell you why you're wrong later. But first, first, let's do some <laughs> retro news. All uh, right. So... so um, First story for you today, Billy. Uh, retro Atari game found after being lost for 40 years. So uh, there was a game called Sonar developed by Brad Stewart. And according to, to Atari, it was one of two unreleased Atari 2600 games that he worked on with Code Tutor being the other one. Um, it was kind of like a toy version of Battleship. Anyway, they huh. had no idea where it went because it was never finished. There was a prototype. And then they end up uh, some guy found it in his collection and got a hold of Brad. And now there is one working prototype copy and no remaining ROMs, but they're going to obviously dump it and make it available right. because this would be the first thing that has been discovered since like the 90s. Um, so the owner said that he was pretty sad they didn't get to speak to the original owner of the game. He passed away. And the guy who found the prototype, who was not named in the article, met uh, the daughter. And she said that he threw away a ton of other floppies and other Atari stuff previous to 
him passing away. So there could have even been more prototypes floating around. Um, so you can look in the landfills of the San Francisco Bay Area if you want to find any other retro stuff. Uh, wow. Billy, what do you think about Atari? Um, so I was born in 1976. My first game console was the Atari 2600 in about 1982 or 83. Um, at the time, it was amazing. I loved Atari. As I've gotten older, obviously, Atari has not held up at all. Um, I sold my Atari because I hadn't even thought about using it in a couple of years. But anytime you find a piece of history like this, an unreleased game, that's amazing. Like, I haven't played an Atari game in years, and I would play this game. Because, what are we, 45, 46 years from uh, the launch of the Atari, and they found an original game that had never been released? That is crazy. That's amazing. Yep. Um well, there's only one level, Billy, and it flickers, and, and it's not obviously finished as a prototype. <laughs> but, but if you do want to try it, um, they dump the ROM and they put it on the Atari Age website for public consumption because obviously it's something that this is important. It's it's media that was yes. lost. Now it's found. It's for the public. So, right, and uh, you know I'm a big fan of. Uh, memorabilia and media preservation i think uh video games specifically have a very very poor reputation for um preserving their history properly there's a couple people out there trying to do it but there's been no organized concerted effort by publishers and stuff like that so much stuff has been lost over the years um that's why I do lean a little bit into collectors because at least collectors are preserving things. I hear you. Um, my last six months, uh, my friend Scott, who I'll give a shout out to, and I have been trying to catalog and uh, take pictures of every Nintendo 64 strategy guide because PDFs are so incredibly hard to come by for them. So at the very least, right. If they're not, if we if we don't scan them all, which I've personally scanned a couple uh, Quest 64 guides into PDF just because their yeah. PDF doesn't exist of them, but um, and they put them on archive.com, they'll get taken down. But you know, it is what it is. Right now they're up. Uh, but the plan is to uh, collect and if not have the physical one in our collection, have a PDF version or at least the cover photo of every strategy guide because nobody has bothered to do this. And finding things like that is incredibly hard for collectors. And not even that, just knowing that the media exists is the only way that we really preserve the history of these strategy guides. And some of the best parts about them, about them are uh, a lot of the unauthorized ones have stuff that was sent in early, like pre-release games. So like maps that don't match or items that don't exist. And once the games were released, all that stuff is lost. So if you don't find stuff in old magazines and old strategy guides, you don't know what the like vision of the game was before it was released. A lot of times stuff was chopped out entirely or you lose entire games. There's um, there's a Nintendo 64 strategy guide for ODT, Escape uh, or Die Trying, which was released on the PlayStation, but it never, uh-huh. like weeks, weeks before it was supposed to come out on N64, it was chopped. But the strategy guide for the N64 one exists, so you know, like there's stuff there that's 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 history. It does it doesn't exist without that piece of paper. So yeah, that that's awesome, and it's it's very true. Um, he, somebody has to document all this stuff, and you know, for our listeners, let's let's throw Mike a little bit of credit. He likes to push all this kind of stuff. Um, Mike is a legitimate gaming historian and expert in a lot of areas that he's hesitant to admit. Uh, Mike put together the Excel spreadsheet for Japanese Nintendo 64 games and what percentage of English is used in these games, such as from 0% in Goemon to 100% English for Super Bowling. 
and Mike put this whole spreadsheet together. And Mike, how many games are in the N64 Japanese collection? 196. Look at that. See, this, he, he kind of plays down the fact that he's an expert on this kind of stuff. But I just want our listeners to know that Mike knows what he's talking about. But it's not, we don't do things like that so we get like name recognition. It's more because I want people to play. If I don't get people playing Nintendo 64 games or really any video games, me knowing stuff about them or, you know, preserving history doesn't mean anything if no one's interested. So right. if we don't get people need- playing games, then what's the matter? Like I can talk about stuff all yeah. day. <laughs> yeah, no, we definitely need t- people to carry on the tradition. Um, I don't want to get into a whole other thing here, but let's be honest, man. Uh, that's why I have such uh, an aggressive stance towards gatekeepers of our hobby. Um, people that are like, oh, you're not a real game collector unless this. And, you know, they kind of razz on the new guys for only having like five or six games or something. But at one time, we only had five or six games. And these are the guys with giant collections and they're like gatekeeping the hobby. And this happens in every hobby. It is definitely not exclusive to uh, video game collecting. But if you do not bring new people into your hobby, then your hobby dies with you. That's it. It's our, it, it's, it's both altruistic of us to share what we know, but on some level, it's a little bit selfish of us also to bring in new people because we know this stuff, we have this stuff, and we need someone to pass it on to, or it's all been for nothing. You know? And, Absolutely. And I just, I kind of have an aggressive stance toward anyone that gatekeeps anything that people might enjoy. I, I see it as unnecessary, and I also see it as unrealistic. Like, it's bad for the hobby, man. And uh, I also want to point out, you said you don't do this for recognition or whatever. I know when I got my copy of that spreadsheet, uh, the Excel list with the percentages of English to Japanese on the Japanese Nintendo 64 games, your name was not on it. But yet I talked to you for a long time while you were working on it. So... I, I don't know. I couldn't have done all that work just as a labor of love and at least not sign my name to it. Yeah, it's not my thing. <laughs> I, don't, I don't watermark. I don't watermark my memes either when I when I ask post all over Twitter. So that's none of that. <laughs> no paper trail back to me. I just do the thing and then I move on to the next thing. So, uh, so yeah. Well, speaking of the next yeah. thing, uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Billy. New movie, Mutant Mayhem, post-production coming up. Coming out, uh, they're expecting it around August. How do you feel about that? So here's my first question. Is this live action or is this animated? Is this CGI? Anim- animated. Animated. Okay, so I'm going to say uh, on a 1 to 100 scale, my excitement is about uh, 65. Do you want me to Live give you some of, some of the actors, and then you can decide whether that increases your your excitedness? It's probably not, but go ahead. Let's hear it. Uh, Jackie Chan is Master Splinter. Okay. Uh, Seth Rogen is Bebop. John Cena is Rocksteady. Okay. Are you, do you, none of that's doing it for you so far? Uh <laughs> I have opinion. I have opinions, man. I think Jackie Chan is a great choice for Splinter. Uh, Seth Mo- Rogen might even be a, a, a decent bebop, and I have no problem with John Cena. I think he's a fine actor. Actually, I think he's the best wrestler turned actor ever because he's the only one that has actually tackled um, a full range of roles and been successful in everything from action to comedy to drama. I think John Cena is a pretty damn good actor there's a lot of other people you would recognize in here but not um the important thing is is none of the big names are you know the turtles themselves so it doesn't have the same problem that the mario movie has right now where everybody is critiquing who's talking oh so yes i have a problem with this and let me tell you why okay so my excitement level 
just went up to a solid 80 by knowing that there are no big names attached to the Turtles. Because I feel like in the last uh, 10 to 15 years or so, animated movies have made this weird transition from dedicated voice actors who are really, really good at doing different voices, different tones, giving a certain vibe into casting Hollywood's biggest stars who just sound like themselves. And that's kind of my issue with Mario, as you mentioned it, is, man, it's Mario's body, but it's still Chris Pratt. Like, Chris Pratt does not sound any way Mario should sound. And it's not his fault. This is a, a production problem. It's a director problem. It's a studio executive problem because they want big names attached to these things. But I think a lot of fans want to see their animated characters as a character. We don't want a big name celebrity who is just doing their own voice, overshadowing what the character is supposed to be. I hear you. I am I'm less upset about all of that stuff. <laughs> It's not, I don't have like a specific like reason. I just, I guess I just separate the movie from the, I just want to watch it. And it helps having, I have younger children. So it helps me right, just, cause right. they don't care. They don't care that, you know, that Seth Rogen is Donkey Kong or whatever. They don't, they don't care about any of that. So right. just seeing them enjoy it, like then I'm fine with it. I can, I can live with it as long as they don't like absolutely butcher it or try to make it something that it's almost worse when they do try to do a voice like if you know jack black is great sometimes but like if but if like seth rogan was trying to do a voice that just wasn't seth rogan i'm sure i'd be able to tell and that would be more annoying than just him being seth rogan yeah well yeah i could see that but i i don't know i i have an issue with like the demise of dedicated voice actors because that was a legitimate trade and these people were really, really good at it. Um, I'm not upset over it. I would just prefer if we had voice actors instead of big name celebrities in animated movies. Um, and I, I, I get your excitement level because you have kids, you get to enjoy it with the children. I don't have young kids. My, my, my youngest kids of mine are 23 years old. And my stepson is 18, and they're all kind of a-holes, you know? I ask them all the time, hey, let's watch this cool movie. And they're not into it. But then my granddaughter comes to visit, and she's like six. And, man, I'm watching Coco Melon, and I'm like, this is pretty good. This is pretty good. <laughs> uh. So... Would you have... Well, I'm. I mean, I'm sorry you don't get to enjoy it. I'm gonna make my. I'm gonna make my 18 year old go. So. Uh, oh, I try, I man. They, but you know, they want. <laughs> I, I can. I can get them to go if, like, we're going to the theater to see the new Star Wars movies. I can get them to go with me. Um, but if I'm putting on a movie in the living room on a big TV, no, they're not gonna hang out and watch a movie with us ever. And it's weird. I'm like, oh, man, I just want to enjoy this as a family. It's Will Ferrell. He's going to do something stupid. <laughs> That's, I'm glad you said that, Billy. I got another story about something stupid and something that you're not going to be able to do. Uh, just this week, E3 was officially canceled for this year. So the uh, huge video game... I, I, whatever you want to call it, gangbang, where everybody gets yeah. around and shakes hands about video game. Uh, IGM just confirmed the news that just about everybody saw coming for, uh, it's been weeks, maybe even months now. Uh, they announced their in-person return after COVID, and uh, it just looks like every company, Microsoft, Nintendo, Sony, any, any Konami, everybody's just pulling out one at a time to do their own thing. So they've just now officially canceled E3 altogether. Oh, you know, uh, a long time ago, E3 was cool. 
it was cool, man. It's the well, what's the E three stand for? Electronics Expo something. I, I can't even an expo. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, all the video game companies used to get together, and I love that picture that floats around on the internet, the meme, and it's got Xbox, PlayStation, Nintendo, and Sega, all the banners next to each other. And it said, once the four great nations lived in peace. Um, and those were the days. And, you know, everybody looked forward to E3 with all the announcements. The internet wasn't super heavy back then. Um, and then cool collectibles came out of E3 that were only available there. And it was what it was. But over the years, with the rise of how prevalent the internet has invaded every single aspect of our lives. Uh, Nintendo switched to the Nintendo Direct format. They were kind of the first one to drop out of E3, and they just didn't see it a, a reason to do E3 when they could just do it themselves. And I think everybody else is just kind of doing the same thing. Like we're, they're thinking we're all connected to everyone anyway. Why do we have to spend? two million dollars to do a preservation uh presentation at e3 when we can broadcast it on our youtube or on our website and it's not going to cost us but a thousand dollars to set up you know it it just doesn't make sense it's not putting more eyes on it by going to e3 yeah and it, I mean, it seems sad to just say that it's done, but we haven't had an E3 right. since 2019 now or 2018. It's been yeah. years, three plus years now since we've had one. And nobody's really bad at I at no E3. There's still been some cons, but yeah, like you said, Nintendo has direct, the PlayStation's got their, their PS up or whatever it is. And like, nobody really cares. Every, every Ubisoft, all those companies just do their own thing now. So it, I find yeah. out when I find out. I don't need to go somewhere to find out about it. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, dude, uh, being a part of the video game community, uh, I got to say, we don't need an E3. If I miss the Nintendo Direct, I promise you I'm going to know everything that happened in that Nintendo Direct 83 seconds after it's over. Because this community, like, everyone stays on top of everything. Everybody knows the most current news. Um, I think I, it, it does sound sad to say E3 is gone because of the stature that it once held. But I also feel like it, it, it died a natural death. Like it went down, not in some horrendous fire. It just kind of phased itself out to where it was no longer a needed thing. Yeah, I just, I don't, I honestly don't think it'll be missed. It's, it'll, maybe we'll get an anniversary at dawn some point right. where they're like, hey, 10 years since last E3, let's get together. But I, right. I doubt it. And I, and I don't really care. You know what? That, that would actually be cool if they did uh, an E3, like every 10 years or so, just like a, a E3 get together. And then whatever the companies come together one time a decade to throw out their news you know that that would make e3 special but other than that i don't really see any need for it in any way yeah so next up we have um and this is close to my heart ben studio uh co-founder michael berlin has died he um he passed away at 73 years old he had a cancer for a number of years um, he's best known uh, for creating Bubsy the Bobcat before Sony uh, acquired Bubsy. it. My mom loved Bubsy. So I was a, a tortured Genesis kid growing up. I didn't have Super Nintendo. Or any, <laughs> we, I was about to ask so we if played you a, played it on Super Nintendo or Genesis. Uh, absolutely Genesis. Bubsy 1 and 2 all the time, man. I mean, there's other great games. We played General Chaos, and we played uh, I played the Fantasy Star games. and But, I mean, we had to rent Super Nintendos so we could play them for, uh -huh. you know, family video and stuff. So, But we played a lot of Bubsy. We owned both of those. Um, anyway, let's get <laughs> – anyway, um, yeah. so Michael – back to Michael Berlin. Uh, 
their company was acquired uh, by Sony later on. He did stick around for Bubsy 3D, and then they worked on the Siphon Filter games before he left the industry altogether. Um, I mean, everybody's got great things to say about him. He was, you know, funny and thoughtful and intelligent, and everybody kind of missed him in the industry. It's been 15 plus years now since he's been in there. He's just kind of been a like a figurehead, and right. Um, and anytime any of the the originals pass away from any of the, even though you know, Ben Studio wasn't like some huge name, they were big enough for Sony to want to acquire them and obviously go on with Bubsy right. and the other things that they were doing. So, yeah, that's awesome. And that you know, look, I, I love seeing studios that got acquired that were acquired because people like this were so talented and they wanted them to make more games for them. Uh, it's not like the acquisitions now where they acquire studios, put them out, put one game out and then shut it down with people this talented. You just let them make more games, man. It's what they do. Bubsy was a great series. Uh, Siphon filter was a great series. I, I kind of started losing Siphon filter a little bit. I don't know how many they made after the Omega strain on PS2. That was kind of the last one for me. Uh, but like Siphon filter one and two and three were just crazy amazing. Bubsy were great games. But yeah, I, like I said, all my my memories are all tied to the Genesis ones. Bubsy 3D didn't really do it for me. I'm more of like a Bubsy 3D apologist than I am like, like an active <laughs> like lover of the game. Like, don't, it was better in Earthworm Jim 3D, so let's not drag a franchise just because of their first foyer into the three-dimensional world. <laughs> they did the best they could! <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> Speaking of doing really good, though, uh, next story, Dungeons & Dragons, almost $40 million. It's opening weekend at the box office. Billy, were you a D&D guy growing up? Absolutely. Absolutely. As a matter of fact, um, on my YouTube channel, I actually did the nerd news for a couple weeks, and I talked about uh, the Dungeons & Dragons movie, and I, w that's one of the things I talked about because Wizards of the Coast had made a couple missteps with the community around that time, and uh, I was wondering how it was going to do on opening weekend, and I even said, you know, regardless of how I feel about Wizards, I still want to see the movie because I loved D&D &D as a kid. And now I saw they have a D20 popcorn bucket you can get at the theater. Yeah. I'm going this weekend, dude. Get out of here. I'm going to put my yeah, milk duds in that thing. Dude, that's all it takes. All it takes is just some positive <laughs> word of mouth and, like, some enthusiastic reviews and then throw a thing, you know, a cup or a bucket. That's all it takes. Like, it, it doesn't – You our, the, the community, <clears throat> the retro, the, you know – the nerd community, like you like to put it, like we don't, we're easily pleased. Yeah, yeah we made bad mouse yeah. and stuff where like, you know, if it's not the way we like it, but that doesn't mean we're not going to go consume. Like I don't, if I don't oh. like the newest games that are coming out, yeah, I might talk about it a little bit, but like hell, if I'm not going to buy a new game games every year, it's still going to happen. <laughs> so just give me the cup, yeah. you know, g give me a hat or a t-shirt and I'll be, I'll shut up. Right. I promise. Yeah. Like, dude, yeah. Uh, even if I was on the fence, if I was like real iffy about it, I was like, oh, I'm not so sure I want to see that movie because blah, blah, blah. And then, and, and then somebody tells me, well, they have a 20 sided dice popcorn bucket. I'd be like, screw it. Let's go get in the car. We're going. <laughs> yeah, buddy. Just give me, give, give me the little things. You know, I'm such a nerd deep in my soul that I can't pass up a 20 sided dice popcorn bucket, you know? Uh, it, 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 like you said, it doesn't matter. It, it could be a hat or a t-shirt or whatever. Like I'm getting that thing. I want it because I want everybody to know that I love this stuff, you know? So yeah, yeah I'll go see the movie. I'm probably going this weekend. Figure that out. I can't go see it this weekend it's the, <laughs> because the Mario movie comes out this week and me, uh, going out in the public to see a, a theater movie twice in the month is just too much. That's too much excitement for me. So. <laughs> yeah, well, we'll see. Uh, man, I, I wish you wouldn't have said that because 
Now my wife is going to be like, well, I don't really like Dungeons and Dragons. We should go see Mario. And also, she does anything she can to annoy me. Uh, she has beaten exactly two games on Nintendo Switch. One of them was Hidden Objects, and the other one was Link's Awakening. However, because she likes to annoy me the entire time she played the game, she only referred to it as Mario in the Forest. And uh, she, she knows how to go straight to your heart, Billy. She, she won you over, and now she's continuing every year to make you more and more happy as a husband and a father. <laughs> she's got a great sense of humor, and she knows how to poke at me. And I'm like, it's it's not Mario in the forest. Uh, uh, I was just All excited right. she was playing it. I was willing to deal with a lot. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. My wife, um, other than mobile games like Candy Crush, stuff like that, uh, the only other kind of games she likes are... Um, like daily life simulators. So she likes Animal Crossing, oh. uh, Dewdrop Valley, or Stardew Valley, um, things like that where she's just farming and doing everyday stuff because she likes to re- just play to relax. So it's the good thing about those are I never have to bother about beating it because you don't beat them. You just play them until, they're, until right. she's sick of playing right. them. Then she goes back and she doesn't, have, I, she doesn't remember where she is. She just goes right back into it again. So I embrace, uh, embrace the wives playing the games that they enjoy and try not to... Like you said, we're not we don't gatekeep. We just play the All games. right, so you you just mentioned that and we got to sidetrack here for a split second because my wife is also a Candy Crush player and she says all the time, "I'm not a gamer." And I'm like, "How long have you been playing Candy Crush? That game right there." And she said, "11 years." And I'm like, "You're a gamer. You might play games on a mobile phone, but you've been playing one game for 11 years." Also, I like to pick at her and tell her if she was any good, she would have beat it eight years ago. <laughs> I don't think you can beat it. Is Can you beat Candy Crush? I swear to God, they add no. levels like every week so that you can never get to yeah, the end that, or something like that. It's every so often they add like a couple hundred levels or something. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah you can. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I, I've played, and it's a good, like, I'm, I like match three games. I like those like right. folly puzzle games i like that but like when you just know like if i've lost to a level like 30 40 times and i just keep teasing that i need to spend money on it that's when i immediately undownload it and then complain about it and then re-download it like two months later because i can hear her playing it across the couch or something like that right i've even asked her i'm like how much money have do you think you've spent on that game and she's like Oh, a long time ago, I used to pump money into it for levels or whatever. But she says she hasn't in a long time. Also, because she likes to irritate me with game names, I will never call it Candy Crush. Not ever. It's always Bubble Blast. And that (laughs) kind of gets under her skin. Oh, you over there Bubble Blasting, huh? (laughs) Love it. So last thing I got before we go into our... uh weekly topic is a couple anniversaries um 28 years ago konami opened konami computer entertainment studio so that was a separate Ooh. division of konami that did uh mystical ninja starring goemon they did hybrid heaven uh, there's a few other games a couple of other n64 games but a lot of the late 90s konami games came out of konami computer em- entertainment say that five times fast Konami Computer Entertainment Studios. <laughs> so that was 1995, 28 years ago, and 30 years ago today, Breath of Fire debuted on Super Nintendo. Breath of Fire, what a great series, man. I do not think I've played more than five hours of any one Breath of Fire game on any system ever. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. I'm like, not a big tech. Tactics guy didn't play a lot of Final Fantasy Tactics or Ogre Battle or like any of the even I liked Advance Wars, but I only kind of liked uh-huh. it because it was hard. And they I don't like getting beat. Right. I don't like having to to move guys around one square at a time and get my get my stuff handed to me. I don't always love that. You know, now that you mention that, man, there's like some games I like playing like that. Uh, I know don't. Don't jump on me too hard for this, but I was actually a big fan of Populous on Super Nintendo. Um, Isometric, grid-based 
uh, I guess, what would you consider it? A god tactician? Yeah, like a uh, like a, a fighting a, Sim City. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like a God Simulator or something. Um, so yeah, I uh, I enjoyed that very much. However, as I've gotten older, less and less so, man. I uh, got Mario and Rabbids for Switch, and yeah. it's kind of grid based, and I hated it. I'm like, this is terrible. I tried several times to play it, and I just I wasn't in it, man. I just wasn't there. That's one of the few I've actually enjoyed, but it was because I brought it. I brought the Switch on one of our vacations. Now it would have been last year now. Uh-huh. Um, and so I played in bed, and that was the only game. I didn't want to keep getting up and changing games, so I just left it in. So after a couple uh-huh. hours, I got into it, and I, and I got through most of the game. That, But that's the first uh, like grid tactics the style of game I've enjoyed in a while. And maybe just because it wasn't super difficult at the beginning. The end levels are hard. They ramp it up quick, but it was <laughs> inviting enough for me to to get into it. You, to, talking about ramping it up quick, ha, have you ever played Bendy in the Ink Machine? I have not. All right, so... My daughter was telling me, she's like, Dad, you have to play Bendy. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to check this out. So I got it for Switch because when I play on a new console, that's 99% of what I play is the Switch. And there's it's like a, a satire, of, a horror satire of Disney. Uh, Bendy is like an evil Mickey Mouse. And at one point you have to fight Goofy or a Goofy satire or whatever up until that point you have done very very little in the way of using anything as a weapon or fighting and then all of a sudden this huge fight where you have to beat the crap out of him it's like the difficulty spikes from a three to an eight with the close of a door and that frustrated me, man. I like a nice, smooth uh, arc on the uh, learning curve, the difficulty curve. You can't jump on me like that. I'm not prepared. <laughs> You're too old for that. Yeah. You got to give me time to warm up to it. <laughs> I'm actually, so this is a little embarrassing, but I'm actually playing... So like I said, I you know grew up in Genesis Purgatory. So uh, a lot of people like to jump on me about not playing Super Nintendo era RPGs. So I'm playing Earthbound for the first time right now. You know, in my uh-huh. in my late my late thirties, I am not enjoying it as much as ever. <laughs> I think I would enjoy it more if everybody wouldn't keep telling me that it's like one of the top you know fifteen games of all time or top ten RPGs of all. Or you know, if people would just say, yeah, Earthbound is like quirky, you know, weird fun, and you you really like it, Mike. Like I I think I would have been more into it, but everybody telling me like, so I had all sorts of like problems with the inventory at the beginning, and like the same thing level jumps like you leave the first area and you get wiped and you got to go back and you and it's a turn-based rpg so you got to walk back go over the thing level up a little bit get it handed to you walk back revive right start over and i'm you know man i'm not loving it but i'm also very stubborn and i do things just to do them so now i'm about halfway through it and i decided i'm just going to finish it regardless just so i can say that i played it all the way through and then nobody can hang that over the top of me, like, you know, for the rest of my life. Right, right. You know, um, yeah, I, I played Earthbound. I, did, I never got a chance to play it when I was young. So I played it for the first time when uh, I was an adult. It was probably about eight years ago. And uh, I thought it was okay. I enjoyed the quirkiness of it. And it, I thought it was okay. I think most of the, I, I don't know how to put it. People are like overhyped about this game. It's not a bad game, but I don't think it is this uh, top tier upper echelon game. I just, I don't, I don't see it. I just think we're old enough to understand that there's way more nostalgia attached to the games from when we were 
you know, oh, teens and younger than we want to admit. Like I have the, I hear the same. So I also haven't played Chrono Trigger. I've turned it on, but I haven't gotten any further than the first, you know, so that's going to be another one that I have to play next. That's another one of those games. Everybody says you have to play it and then you have to play it a second time because you can't get all, you know, 46 endings. If you don't go back and play the new game plus and jump around in the, like, don't say things like that to me, like, as a way to convince me to play it. If you're telling me to play a game and enjoy it, I have to play it more than one time the first time I play it. Like, that's not the way you, that's not the way to my heart. Don't, like, don't attach your nostalgia about how much fun you had playing this game 15 and 20 times to somebody who's just struggling to find time to play that at games that he does like already. Like, that, that's not, so now I'm I'm already, like, checked out of, of the Chrono games for now. Because I haven't played Chrono Cross either. So I'm, right. I'm putting those completely on the back burner until I play everything else that I want to play. And then I'll go back to those. Because I don't want, I'm sure I have to spend 30, 40 hours, and I'm not committed to that. Yeah, no, I I get that. Um, what, there are a number of games. Um, we didn't, you had Genesis as a kid. We were just super poor. So there was a lot of stuff. <laughs> that uh, I missed out on. Um, And so I get to play, excuse me, I get to play a lot of games as an adult that I never got to play as a kid. And sometimes, like Earthbound, I was a little let down, probably because of all the hype around the game. Like I said, I don't think it's bad, but I think it was just overhyped to me. Um, But then there's games where... I passed them up as a kid because it did not seem like it was worth my money. I was probably, you know, 21 at the time or so and passed up Majora's Mask. And it is absolutely one of the best Zelda's games, Zelda games ever made. And the first time I played that game was three or four years ago. Probably. Yeah, I, I had it in my collection for a long time at that point. But I was always like, I'm not gonna play this. I don't. I don't want to sit through that cycle. I don't want to be on a timer in a Zelda game. And it ended up being amazing. And I remember thinking, I'm really glad I got to play this as an adult because as a kid, I don't feel like I could have appreciated it properly. Yeah, I would have had to been one. So once I also didn't play it. I was a little older, but I didn't play it till my 30s and i'm glad that i waited um i think i probably would have liked it as as a younger adult but i i don't know those games i was already not a huge ocarina fan which i talked about already so get it's getting over that hill of being able to play it the way you want to play the beginning of that game is very stressful until you until the time starts happening and that until you so Getting over that hill as a kid, maybe not so much. As an adult, I knew what was coming. Uh, It's just one of those things where, once again, everybody's opinion of it, like, puts weight on your shoulders before you even play it. So maybe it would have been better as a kid because then I didn't have, I wouldn't have had my friends because there wasn't any within five miles of me. (laughs) Like, I maybe it would have been easier to lose it myself, especially in the, you know, early years of the, uh, granted that's pre-2000, but the years of the N64 where there wasn't hundreds and hundreds of games when you buy a game and that's the game you had for the year, maybe yeah. I would have enjoyed it more because I've been forced to enjoy it. Yep. And I don't know, man. I, uh, there were certain games that I played as a kid that I play as an adult. And I, I think this is just as good as when I played it as a kid. I'm going to throw this one out there because it's like my de-stress game. When I'm stressed out, I could always put it on and relax. It's mindless. DuckTales on NES. DuckTales is like, it's just as good as when I was seven. You know? Is that the is that the plunger shooting Scrooge McDuck thing? No, he's bouncing on his cane. Oh, the cane. That's what it is. Yeah, I do. I think I remember that. I know I played it. I don't probably don't remember it. Obviously, if you play it all the time because it's your de-stressor, you played it more than me. But yeah, um, it, it's a 
I don't know. I can hear the music to the moon level in my head. So I, I love that game. And that's one of those games where I played it as a kid. I played it as an adult. I feel like I enjoy it the same. But then there's games that I played as a kid and I play now, and I'm like, this is a terrible game. This is just not very good, you know? And then there's games like I would have never liked this as a kid, but as an adult, I like it. So I don't know where well, you go. There that's, you are. That's a- That's a great segue, Billy, because the good thing about being an adult now is we have choice. It's not about what our parents got us for Christmas or, you know, saving up all your lawn mowing money to get one game because, (laughs) you know, Turok was $89.99 at ShopGo, and that was the game you were going to have for the entire summer. We have choice now. You have money. We're adults. We're responsible, and we can buy what we want. And the other choice we have is... Yeah, as long as our wives let us. (laughs) <laughs> uh, no we buy what we want anyway uh <laughs> the choice now is physical or digital this is what billy wanted to talk about this week so i'm gonna let you start i'll play no matter what side you you originally take i'll play devil's advocate and i'll go the other way keep it interesting for our listeners all right so i'm a bit of a flip-flopper on this um i think there's an importance to physical preservation But if I have to take a side right now, I take digital. Wow, that I I feel like my chest is caving in saying that because I'm a player, man. I just want to play games. I don't need to own everything. I don't feel the need to actually own anything. Just I just want to have access to the games. I just want to play the games, man. So if I could have everything loaded up onto my computer and I could just plug my controller in and I could play. I'm happy. That's the end of it. Like, I don't need, I think, I don't know. I think some things need to be preserved, but for me personally, I just want to play. So it doesn't matter if I have a physical game because eventually I'm going to wear that bastard out, you know? All right. Well, what's the, I'll, so I'm going to be physical then. So I'll All I'll right. do some bully points for physical, and then you tell me why I'm wrong, why digital is superior. So my first my first selling point, if I was trying to sell physical games to somebody, is I can share my games with my friends. If they have a game and I have a game, and we want to trade, we can't do that with physical unless we trade our systems. But I can do that with physical. I can give somebody Super Mario Odyssey on the Switch, and they can give me Metroid Dread. All right, that's a major bonus for physical. I'll give you that. But I suppose in your perfect world, we are playing games together and everybody is enjoying games in the same house. And it doesn't matter if it's physical or digital. You're sitting in the backyard playing Mario Kart 64 with your buddies. So it doesn't matter who owns it because we're all one big community. But I still like we my friends don't live close to me. So I get it, you know. I'm not right. doing this a lot. Like, I'm not trading a lot, but I do. My brother lives relatively close to me, and I've given him some games because he just bought a Switch not that long ago, six months ago. So I was able to just right. hand him some games and just get him started. That made me feel good. Yeah, no, that's look, I, I definitely see a benefit there. Um, and uh, you're going to make me argue against myself here. You don't own. Your digital game, that's that's what's messed up. Like you're you're basically leasing it. You know, you pay the purchase price, but when they decide they don't want you to have it anymore, you don't have it anymore. You can't sell that. You can't get resale value off of a digital game. It's done. It's just you. You're right. You can't share. Point for physical. <laughs> <laughs> so. Piggybacking what you did, just said, another really cool thing about physical is last week here, we because I live in a, a less temperate climate than some people, we had a huge blizzard and the internet went out. Guess what still worked when the internet went out? My N64. Yeah, well, you could drop a house on a Nintendo 64 and it's still going to work. But I, I couldn't. 
I couldn't go on and play anything on any of my online connected systems because uh, the digital games that I downloaded obviously weren't available because you can't connect to the servers and stuff like that. So my kids were pissed off because they couldn't play Roblox and I had to deal with it. So then I had to share. I had to go bust out two Game Boys, uh, two <laughs> DSs, so they could play some DS. Granted, the internet was only out for a couple hours, but if it was like a day, do you know how painful that would have been around here? Like with no Netflix and no YouTube, and and then the kids didn't have games to play. Like I would have been one hurting daddy unit, but I had physical oh, media. <laughs> Mike, we had a bad storm here like uh, two years ago, and uh, the power was out. And our power was out for a couple days. And, you know, we have a fireplace in the house, so it's fine. It was the middle of winter. It was a big blizzard. And uh, there was some trees down down the road, knocked out power lines, whatever. So my kids couldn't watch TV. So they went and pulled out the Game Boy Advances, the DSs, and they were watching the Game Boy Advance uh, Video Now stuff, like oh, yeah, SpongeBob yeah. episodes and stuff. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, yo, you know, you dudes are like 18, 19 years old, right? Like, there's there's like Dragon Ball Z episodes on those, dude. There's, there's stuff for everybody. There's. <laughs> <laughs> I'm amazed you even had those in your house, Billy. Come on, man. I like the weird stuff. <laughs> Speaking of the weird stuff, that's another great thing about physical games, Billy. If they ever eliminated the physical games, with that, they would eliminate the special legendary collector's editions. And I like stuff. We just talked about your your D20 popcorn bucket. I like keychains and notebooks and and whatever pop figures and all sorts of. Things. I like that stuff, especially if I'm gonna if I'm gonna commit to buying a game. If I'm gonna pre-order, it takes a lot, first of all, for me to pre-order something these days. But if I am, there better be some cool thing like the new Legend of Zelda. If you order it uh, from Japan, you get a fork and spoon with the Tears of the Kingdom, like a metal what? fork and a spoon. Yep. So if you're, you're going to make me order something, it better have cool extras. And if you pre-order it digitally, you're not getting any of that, Billy. None of it. You get nothing. And you like it. You, get, you, you do get it on time. And it... it oh. Okay. Uh, so, why does digital cost the same as physical? Because you're still paying the development team, Billy, and you're still paying for the servers to hold the game for you to download and re-download Understood. when you break your Switch or whatever. There's no case being made. There's no disc being made. There's no cartridge being made. This is digital. Why is it not cheaper? But that's so this all the deepest there's part. There's no cash used to move it the, from one place to another. That's all cheap, too. That's all streamlined infrastructure stuff. They don't care about any of that. All the cost is in the development of the game and the teams that have to make it. You're always trying to recoup it what it costs to make it, not what it costs to produce it. Oh, boy. <laughs> okay. Carts don't cost... You know no, carts no. don't cost anything. <laughs> you know how much is a... When's the last time you bought a spindle of DVDs? How much does a spindle of DVDs cost you? It costs nothing. Nothing. Yeah. And that's for a hundred. Imagine buying, you know, whatever. Or if you're putting Call so, of Duty games, imagine buying three million at a time. Sony's get plus Sony makes them. They don't care. <laughs> they make the DVDs. They make the Blu-rays. Yeah, that's true. So here's a question for you. Just, you, you just, think, yeah. yeah. Do you think that uh, collector's editions uh, have become so commonplace that most of them are just outrageously stupid? Yeah, I feel like they've been trying to one-up each other. Like, every game has to one-up the last really stupid thing. So I'm a big Borderlands fan. The first Borderlands collector's editions were nice. They were just steel books, and you got an art book. By the time we got to Borderlands 3, it was like a full-on, like, loot crate. Like, the whole, like, it was like a $300 chest with, with like, 14 different things in it. I, I mean, granted, I have I have the one for Borderlands 2 that's pretty big. But um, 
I didn't buy it till long after. I didn't pre-order it. I got it used secondhand because it wasn't digital. But uh, uh-huh. I feel yeah, like it always feels like the next game has to have something even stupider than the last game did. And then on top of that, there's like three levels of stupid. Like there's there's the seventy dollars stupidity level, which is pretty normal. And then there's like the hundred twenty five dollar right. level where you get you get to like rub it in the person below you's face, but you still know that you are right. the elite. Like three hundred dollar. What what did Resident Evil just put out with theirs? That GameStop refunded all the pre-orders for their Resident Evil. Oh whatever yeah. It is. It's, but yeah, having a three hundred dollar, four hundred dollar pre-order, which is just going to get flipped on eBay for you know six and seven hundred dollars. That's it's getting pretty ridiculous to me. Because then it's not about playing the game anymore. It's about just having the thing that you know nobody else can have. It becomes less about the, the actual media itself. But at least it's available. Right. And if we were to do away with so, physical, do you wouldn't yeah. even have the option to look stupid. Yeah, so uh, on that note specifically, uh, I think some of the things they have done are completely uh, <clears throat> shameful and blatant cash grabs. Well, let's focus on one or two things specifically. Uh, Limited run. As far as, okay, the collector's edition, they put out a collector's edition of Among Us, a free online game for, what was it, like $150? And there's no game because the game is free online. And so that's basically what it was. It was an overhyped junk box of junk, loot crate style. I mean, my kids wanted it. I didn't like it. Wait, did you get it? <laughs> no, I didn't let them. They wanted it really bad. That was on their Christmas list, and I just, I just shut it down. I'm like, you can just, I'm like, I can go on AliExpress and get you some Among Us plush, and you'll never know the difference. I promise. There, I mean, there was other stuff in it too, but I mean, but right. yeah, they were. My kids were really big into that game for a while, and everything was sus. Yeah. But no, I didn't I, buy I it. Don't worry. <laughs> okay, but no, seriously, like, it, from a physical, uh, on a physical standpoint, what sense does that make to you? No, it doesn't. I agree with you. It doesn't make a lot of sense. I, and I, I'm not a huge fan of limited run games, like altogether anyway, because just. Just the name itself irritates me because, like you said, everybody should be have access to every game. So if we're putting all the physical right. game that's unavailable any other way on a system, you know, like like they did Glover, like they did a reprint of Glover for a bunch of systems. Um, like why are we putting out games that not everybody can play? If they're not going to do a digital download immediately or make right. a big enough press for everybody to play it. Like, you know, so sometimes Best Buy picks up the limited runs. Like, Doom 64 Best Buy picked up. So then there was more copies, and right. that makes more sense to me. But to have, like, 3,000 of a game that everybody wants, that doesn't make any sense to me. That's, that's like, the, the company is, like, basing itself around gatekeeping. Them. Well, yeah, absolutely. Um, if they were actually – they claim to be about preservation. Uh, we're going to print physical copies of this game and that game. But at the end of the day, they're not about preservation. They are about uh, making as much profit as they can by limiting the amount of games that they can hype up. Um, If you really cared about preservation and getting these games out to people, you would not cut off. 3,000 copies or 5,000 copies of this game and say, that's it. That's all we're making, 5,000. And then you find out a year later that uh, they lied about that because they lie about every game, apparently. And they say, oh, well, we, you know, we make some extra copies in case things get damaged or something. And then they open a physical store with tens of thousands of games in it that have been out of print. That supposedly, you know, we don't have any more of any of these games. They're sold out. And it, you have no idea what's being sold at that point. Like, you didn't buy one of 5,000 copies. You bought one of 15,000 copies. But they're going to scalp the other 10. 
I hear you. But if you're buying games just to say that you're one of blank, that's a lot. I mean, once again, we're talking, this isn't like a baseball card that you, or, you know, like a, like a custom toaster or something. It's a, uh-huh. it's a game that you're supposed to be playing. So if you're buying a game specifically to pop it in a case and make it, you know, one of 2000 never touched block, then I don't want you buying the game anyway. So I don't care how many copies are made. Right. How you know, you? that's a, <laughs> Look, I don't, I don't want to uh, down talk anybody. I am going to preface this by saying, personally, I do not understand it at all. I, I don't understand the thought process here. And so I'm just going to say the majority of limited run collectors that buy every game that limited run puts out, Do not open the games. They're not playing them. I'm in the limited run Facebook group. And 90% of the people in that group have never opened their games. So I I don't understand that. Everybody collects differently. But I don't understand why we're buying thousands of dollars worth of games. And you're never going to open them. The only way I understand that, like I said, is then it, now I'm going to have to flip-flop, too. The only way I understand that is, so, like, I bought Super Blood Hockey, which was a, I don't remember what the, it's a, like, a, a company put it out that's kind of, like, limited run. I think it's special edition games. I, can't I see know, it. I had it. Here. But anyway, I, have, I never I never opened my copy. But that's because it took two years to get the copy, the physical copy, printed, because I pre-ordered it. And in that time, I was impatient. And the, the digital copy came on sale for like four ninety nine or something like that. So I never had to open my physical copy because I had the digital copy. If I had stuck to my guns and said, I paid for this once, I'm going to wait for it, I would have just opened it. But I didn't. I caved in and bought a game twice, which is something I very rarely do. So those, I, that's the only I way I understand the, those people. I did the exact same thing with a game. Uh, Shakedown Hawaii for Wii U. Yep. I I I bought uh a couple copies because you know they were on sale for like three hours. So I bought a couple copies. I hooked a couple friends up when they got here and um I actually never opened mine. I downloaded the game. I, I bought it on the shop and downloaded it. You know, so I never did open that copy because it cost me two dollars or something to play it digitally. Yeah. But if I want if I wanted to play the physical, I could have. And that's so there's my now we're gonna roll up on my last big physical uh the the backbone of my my physical collection is that I like to play it because um I like seeing my kids play it. And the biggest uh-huh. joy that I get is watching my kids. So I have a complete Nintendo 64 North American collection. And I've got a lot of Japanese. But I don't have a complete one yet. But I have them all. They're all loose. None of them are encapsulated. None of them are graded. They're all just on a bookshelf. And the biggest joy that I get is when I tell my kids, like, all right, you're going to come play games with me, but you're going to play you're gonna play on 64. But I let them choose. So they get to walk over like a like a library book and pick media off the shelf. And that is not a feeling that you get with something like an EverDrive or a multi-cart or a, an, you know, an emulation station. Like piecing through a list or a worded list on an emulator is not at all the same as watching kids go over and look at the like physical art that comes along with a game and making a decision based on how cool the label looks which is something we absolutely all did as children. If you went and bought a Nintendo game or a Genesis game or a Super Nintendo game, the first thing you looked at was the front cover. It wasn't the name. It was the art. And even if it didn't match, like if you bought Dragon Warrior and you saw that cool, huge blue and yellow dragon on the front cover, and and then you got home and found this blocky little like cityscape (laughs) overworld with a, like, I know it was a different thing, but that was like everybody remembers the cover of that game. 
and that's important. That's art. That's history. That it, I mean, it, the advertisements that come along with it, like the, you know, riding yeah. home from from Kmart, we, looking at the back of a game was like the highlight of my year. <laughs> dude, can we point out that you just picked out Dragon Warrior of all games, and that you? signified how iconic that art is the box the label and the artist for dragon warrior was akira toriyama the creator of dragon ball z i know you have a soft spot for that game billy i'm trying to get i'm trying to get trying to sway you to my side i do have a soft spot for uh dragon warrior i do that's because of my grandmother she was amazing Go ahead. No, I'm shutting up. You go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's like I said, that you don't get that that experience. And not only picking games from a list, but like you said, you like having the games at your fingertips, and I understand that. Yes. But I feel like when I don't have those the the like physical carts or the the like cases or the manual, if I don't have that stuff, I don't. I'm not invested. I have this problem right. where if I, I'm sitting on my computer with my emulator with like Super Nintendo games, I feel like I can play a game for like 10 minutes. And if I'm not, if I'm not into it, it's too easy for me to just shut it down. And in 15 seconds, I can have another game going and I can do that. Like I don't, nothing good happens in the first 10 minutes of a game unless it's like a beat up game or like a Tetris style game. Like it's all story. It's all build up. And if you go on the invest yourself, so we when we were kids and we bought Dragon Warrior at Kmart and we rode home, that was your game. It, if you weren't invested in the first ten minutes, you're screwed for the rest of the summer, boy. Like that's like that's it. That's the game you have now. You own that game. That's your money. It's gone. Like so, I like having physical cards because I feel like if I go up and pick two games, that that's my afternoon. I've come back downstairs. Those are the games that are by my system. If I don't love it at first, I have to at least give it another hour. Otherwise, I'm not inve- I'm not investing the amount of time that I should be into a game. And I don't get that feeling with an emulator. No, and I, I get that because sometimes I get overwhelmed. And I, I don't know if this is a lot of people, but um, you know me. I have emulators for everything. I have some – I have a decent amount of physical stuff, but uh, – I emulate a lot because it's just easy. Um, But it gets a little lost because you're not actually picking things out. And sometimes I feel like there's just too much to pick from and you can't respect the thing you're picking properly. You know, it it is too easy to just swap out of a game. Yeah. Yeah, I do that. I, I, I feel like that sometimes. So instead of me just continuing to dump on you, let's talk a little bit yeah. about the stuff that the digital is good at. All right. What's one of your, what's one of your favorite things about digital, Billy? Ease of use. It's, it's right there, man. Like, you press play and you're going. I hear you. And like I said, that's why I have – digital copies of some stuff that I have physical copies of. So like golf story, which is another limited run game physically, but digitally. Yeah. It's on my switch. If I don't know what I want to play, like if I don't want to go put another card in and, you know, have that hassle of having to stand up, like I default to games like golf story pretty frequently just because they're already there. So I understand that. That makes sense. I think my first uh, my first Switch game was actually I bought a used Switch Switch as my first one and um, it had one game on it and this is in the date exactly when I finally broke down and got a Switch because uh, the game that was on it it was just released like a month before was Untitled Goose Game. Oh man, and, that's such a great game. Dude, isn't it? Like, I love that game. I we, have a, we have a, a key holder in our kitchen that's a, it's a 3D printed goose from Untitled Goose Game 
that it's got a <laughs> magnet in the beak then it still can hold one like two ounce item so it holds a keychain and my kids like to stick things to it the best part about that game though what so this is another selling point of digital it wasn't when the game came out it was when later on when they released a two-player version and it was a free update uh-huh. to the digital game and then my kids could play it together with two two geese and two geese is a completely different game I'm sure it is. You know, I'm going to say that's a major uh, point for digital is that uh, you can't update a cartridge, man. When that game is out, it's out. You're not updating that. Whatever. If something's wrong with it, it's wrong with it forever. I mean, that's less true now because, like, games with, like, Switch, you can – but, yeah, anything older than the Internet yeah. generation, yeah. There was N60 – people like to put on, like, rose-tinted glasses about, oh, when, when I bought a Sega Genesis game, I know I was getting the full game. I wasn't getting some garbage 80% game with – with updates that I had to download the second. Yeah, you know what? Sometimes you were getting like 60% of a game and that was the whole game and it was broken as hell. And that was the game you paid for. What were you going to do then? What if you bought E.T. on the Atari? Like that's the game. You bought that. That's yours now. Yep. You want 100% of the game? You have 100% of (laughs) E.T. Technically a function. But yeah. They would cut out or just, like, block off access to unfinished stuff in games back in cartridge days. I'd be like, okay, we're going to put a wall right here, and that's going to make sure players can't get to this area. But they would have had an extra couple levels, but we didn't have time. Yeah. (laughs) But, I mean, there was release dates. We we understand that. But, yeah, you're right. Now games sold – I bought the division on Xbox when that first came out because I fell into that okay. trap of my friends wanting something and they did that exact thing. They released the game incomplete, which was okay because we knew what was coming. Like in the, in the first month we knew we were getting a big massive like update, but still playing the game, I think it took us like a day and a half to hit the wall where it was like, "All right, well, what are we doing now? Are we starting over? We can't I can't do this." you know, two more weeks until the quarantine zone or whatever comes out or the updates come out. You didn't have that problem when you were a kid, but at least you know it's coming now. So the benefit of new digital games is even if it's not complete, a lot of times it's free and you know it's coming. All right, and let's be clear. How many games are actually complete now upon release? How many games? Nintendo Nintendo games only, maybe? (laughs) Yeah, like, uh, how many games don't require an update as soon as you put it in? It doesn't have a day one patch. You know, that's that's crazy to me. All right. Yeah, and I under, I'm, yeah, I, I get that. Um, I understand, but I, I mean... I don't think that the things that we talked about are going to sway me away from my my physical collection. I am thinking about paring it down as an old man because I can't be buried with it unless I'm going to make a casket out of Quest 64 cartridges and then people can bury me with my money. I don't like see my collection getting bigger. So I understand the need for for physical media to to die off at some point. Right. You know, I I don't want to see physical media die off. I'm all for the preservation of physical media. Um, But this is a major, major thing for me uh, as far as emulation goes, as far as digital games go. They're priced a certain way. Games cost a certain amount, which means to me is that it makes these games more accessible. It doesn't, the, it, the price of the game is not determined by the rarity because anyone can buy this game. So I think if you want to buy a $600 game for your collection, that is completely up to you and have at it. 
but no one should have to pay $600 just to play a game. Totally agree. Totally agree. It's about accessibility. It's And like you said, it's the opposite of gatekeeping. The more people that right. play a game, the better for everybody. That's the way it should be. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, that's a that's like a major point for me. It's one of the reasons I, I like to sell mod, modded consoles and stuff. Biltendo.com, well, shameless plug there. But uh, it's because I want people to be able to just play games that they want to play. That's what I do. You should, like, come on, man. How mad are you going to be if you've never actually played Sculptor's Cut and you drop $1,200 on it? That's that's not a twelve hundred dollar game if you're buying it to play it. <laughs> you're right. <laughs> yeah, I mean you 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 bring up a lot of great points, and I'm glad that people like you do exist because emulation has its place, digital media has its place, and and more people playing is the place. And that's even this show. This show is here to get people to be excited about games, be as excited as we are, be excited about movies, be excited about TV, comic books, Dungeons and Dragons, get excited about something. Cause if you don't, then it goes away. Like the reason that, yeah. that things are phased out is because people, the like, same reason that the little mom and pop, you know, diner in your, in your town was phased out. If people are stopping excited about the things that you're doing, it goes away and we don't want everything to go away. Some things are okay, but ideally not our favorite hobbies. And that's why Billy and I are here weekly on his show, the Bill Tendo show. Talk it. Yapping. I'm from the South. <laughs> we here to spread right, well, the good word of video games. We're not here to put boots on caterpillars. Say I had to throw a Southern thing in there for you. I like it. All right, go ahead, Mike. <laughs> no, that's it. That's it. I, I, it's probably just about time for us to shut up for this week. I I wanted you to make sure that you uh, said your name three or four more times because that's what you like to do. So once again, this is the Bill Tendo Show, <laughs> BillTendo.com. Everything is about Billy. I'm just here to promote him. <laughs> Billy Billy likes his name. He likes his face. He likes his stickers. Yeah. He likes his website. So <laughs> If you haven't visited Billy's website <laughs> or seen his sticker yet, get on it. Yeah. Thanks, Mike. <laughs> Tire me of my pleasure. Billy, I've had enough of this, though, so I think we should get out of here <laughs> tonight. How are you feeling? All right. Uh, I, I've had enough of you also, so. All right. We'll see you all next week. All right. Y'all have a great week.